Welcome back to Game Tree. Today we're going to look at how to build the perfect team. This could be for a company, a group of friends, a Dungeons and Dragons group, or WoW Guild, basically anything. But the first thing to get out of the way is that while a perfect team does exist, the odds of you recognizing it and being able to recruit all of those people for the perfect roles is basically zero. So what I'm actually going to give you is a methodology about how to build a perfect team based on what already exists and who's available to you. And a lot of this is going to revolve around you yourself, accounting for starting off what are your own weaknesses and working from there. We'll look at analyzing the purpose of your team, the kind of north star that brings people together, as well as getting to know individual people's reasons for being on the team that supersede the team's mission that are important to consider. Also looking at how to find and interview these people and also how to motivate them to join the team and bring the best based on their own personalities and what they naturally enjoy doing and how that adds to the team and making sure it accomplishes its goals. At the end, you'll get more specific information about different types of psychologies and different aspects of people's personality traits that are good in different kinds of roles and just some more considerations around those. And then if you have more questions that aren't covered there, feel free to post those in the comments and I'll try to answer them or maybe they'll even serve as fodder for future videos. Say you have some context on who I am and where I'm coming from with this information. I spent about nine years in depth studying this personality psychology over many thousands of hours. I've done consulting for super elite business teams, helping people understand themselves, their teammates, getting different types of people into certain roles and restructuring teams and figuring out how to better run meetings based on a plethora of psychological types and how to get ideas in the different stages of different kinds of people and the idea generation implementation process. Also running Game Tree for three years now and other startups, being able to see all this theory and how it applies to the real world over and over again across dozens and dozens of people. Before that, also doing research, data analysis, talking in forums, and a lot of YouTubing like this. As well as talking to friends who are also deep into the psychology that's just aggregated over time. So the first step is to figure out what is your purpose? I mean, there's one level of this that is, are you a gaming group? Are you starting a company? What kind of team is this? But also, what is the unified goal that's going to put people together? For example, in a nonprofit, it might be sustaining the organization and the purpose for which the nonprofit is created. But if it's a raiding party, then maybe it's to be able to have an excuse even to get everybody together to build camaraderie between friends. Or if it's a company, profit could be the bottom line. From there, inspect what are the kinds of people you're going to need based on who you are as a person, what are your strengths, skills, weaknesses, and what do you need for the next step and for the bigger picture. So for example, if you're releasing something and you need an artist right away, then that's a pretty obvious need that you're going to find somebody who's either an artist or somebody who enjoys the kinds of things that are needed with art, if that's a big component of the, your team or the project. The next step is to determine what are your more specific needs. Is this a really big project that's eventually going to have 50, 100 people? Or is it a small component of a larger organization with like eight people? Or is it just an adventuring party of four people that you're trying to maximize fun and playability with? Think about where you're at now who are you and who are the people you're already working with as a starting point? What are their personalities like? What do people enjoy doing? And what do you need for the short-term future combined with the long-term? Do you need somebody really innovative? Is that the nature of your team, the, your purpose? Do you need some sort of sniper or a support, an administrator, somebody to help with communication or marketing or external things, building partnerships? Figure out what are your needs, what do you have now, and then plan from there. Knowing yourself at this point is incredibly important and it can ultimately be the difference between being successful and not. Because when you know yourself, you know what are your kinds of weaknesses and blind spots that you need to account for. When to delegate, when to do things yourself appropriately. And it's so, so hard for us to know ourselves because we see the world as if we're wearing glasses and everything's always tinted constantly. We can't see them in the mirror, we can't take them off and look at them. So we have to know what are the biases, what are the tints that we have on our vision. Because so often the truth isn't what you see or what somebody else sees. It's somewhere in between the reality of what you guys see. And knowing where you stand and being able to see where other people stand, which is a little bit easier to do, gives you the wholest, most accurate picture of the truth. So to get this information, you often have to ping off of other people, ask other people what they think about you, because it's so easy for us to just be able to hear any definition, for example in astrology, and just automatically be able to associate with that saying, oh, I have that personality trait, or I can think of a time in my life that I've done this. But being able to see the bigger patterns and what you're really like over time, what your personality is, that requires other people and a lot of different sources of information. So you can check out our video on how to find out your own personality type that we've already made for a good best practices way to get this done. From there, you want to figure out the types of your team. And with this, I really recommend studying this personality psychology more deeply. 
it's really useful beyond even just team building in so many different levels of life and it's a real gem that I wish more people knew about. But even if you don't want that, then there's other ways to figure out their personalities which we'll have more videos on in the future. But otherwise you can turn to our personality test or tests online and look at patterns in the answers. There's also a lot more than just 16 personality types. That's just what Carl Jung started with a long time ago, who said there was many more. And our last video was detailing how there's actually 32 personality types. I thought this was an important distinction to make because about half the population doesn't identify very well with one of the 16 types. So it could be that you or other people are one of the hybrid types that could be very different from a lot of the information given online. A good example of this is with Igor, who started off with GameTree as the chief marketing officer. And what he liked about it is that he likes figuring out the, the data on advertising and being able to optimize ads and be able to do objective market research and be able to procedurally make sure lots of activities get done in an organized way. But those are also a lot of the good activities of a chief operations officer. So based on understanding his psychology deeper and once being able to type them on a more deep level, I realized that he's actually not the strongest chief marketing officer. A lot of the signs were there, but chief marketing officers are also often very extroverted, good at communicating with the tribe, creative, being able to do a lot of business development and sales. So while he had a lot of those skills, he's actually a perfect chief operation officer. So by moving Igor to that role, it opened up a lot of different activities that suddenly became very appropriate for him to do that he really enjoys and has never been happier in this role. But at the same time, also freeing up that chief marketer officer position for people who are actually the best fit for that. Besides learning all the psychology yourself, what you can do to figure out the best kinds of people in the best roles is just research personality types of people who you already know and see the lists of the kinds of jobs that they like and compare across sites to see the common patterns. Or you can look at the job that you're trying to fill and say types four and look at the different Myers-Briggs types or 16 personalities types of the people who most commonly fit into those roles. And it's good, again, to know the psychology with this because for example, with pro being a programmer, you don't necessarily always want three people that are the same kind or that's a broad category. So oftentimes you're gonna get the strongest team through diversity, but within a certain kind of range within a functional unit. The same can be said for many different kinds of teams. For example, in gaming, if you're playing Dungeons and Dragons or a massive multiplayer game or a MOBA, and you need somebody to be the carry or the damage per second role, you usually want somebody who's aggressive. Somebody who's gonna be competitive, likes comparing themselves to others, earning points. Because those kinds of people that care about those traits also tend to, on average, be more into mechanical skills, aware in the moment, compared to somebody who you might already have, who could be more passive, non-confrontational, but just because this person's around doesn't mean that you should necessarily force them into that role, or that you should accept somebody who's applying for a position with that kind of a personality, because they're not gonna thrive, and they're not gonna give the highest performance over time to be able to be sustainable and have fun with something so that they'll keep investing into it in the future. And as you go, don't bring on people who are just like you, especially at the beginning. Our natural tendency is that it's easy for us to communicate and agree with people who are like us, but if you just have people who are like you, then you're all gonna have the same strengths, you're all gonna wanna work on the same things, and your weaknesses are gonna kill you. Just like a colony of ants or bees, we people have a lot of different natural inclinations, and with our hyper high levels of communication and our ability to coordinate and do different kinds of things and use teamwork, then by getting a different balance of people, make sure that all the best tasks get done by specialists who enjoy those activities. It's essentially economics, classical version of division of labor, but based on our personalities and our natural inclinations. Once you know yourself, analyze the team and see what your needs are at the time. For example, if a lot of people are fighting with each other or they're having trouble communicating with the outside world with marketing or branding, then maybe somebody with strong extroverted feeling or extroverted thinking like an ENFJ or an ESTJ is gonna be good because they can help streamline communication, maybe make more globalized rules and standards that are readable by everybody in a team that otherwise might be biased by a lot of thinkers who are more like a laser beam than a flashlight. And when looking for these people, you'll often find that people tend to naturally gravitate towards the kinds of work that they'll enjoy, but it's not always true. For example, you get a lot of people who just follow money or prestige or maybe what their peers or parents are telling them to do. But what you can look for is, is this person going to enjoy a test task? Not just be able to do it well, but actually not complain about it or have a positive attitude towards it because it's something they like doing. Do they have good other hobbies? Do they play similar games to this or similar roles in other places? Or are they just trying to fill a spot because they want to be on this particular team or take advantage of a special opportunity? 
If somebody likes to play management games, then you can assume that they're probably going to actually enjoy and be good at managing because that's fun for them and they're getting extra practice outside of whatever activity you're engaged in together. And this applies for other hobbies as well, where if somebody's going to do something without even getting paid for it, then if you're going to pay them if it's a company or if it's a nonprofit or a volunteer, then you know they're going to do an excellent job at that and it's going to be more sustainable into the long term. When it comes down to picking specific people, you're not always going to have the perfect personality for the right role. Or even if you do have the right personality, there might be somebody else who's just more personally developed and more balanced in addition to having their strength. Or maybe somebody's more available or they're willing to work in a role or certain cross conditions that other people won't. There's so many different conditions. So at least try to look at what you need and don't just look for a top role, but maybe a couple parallel ones that you could fill for. You want to get to know people's very personal reasons as well for getting along with the team besides the overarching mission. So going back to the Dungeons and Dragons analogy, while everybody is coming together to play the game and ideally to be friends and share in emotional experiences, certain people are going to care a lot more about leveling up and getting loot. And other people might be mostly focused on the story and the lore or role playing their character or expression and acting. So you get all these different kinds of people that are within the group that has its own purpose. So analyze your own team, your own team members, and the people that are potentially joining the team and see how they fit. And that'll make you a much better leader by being able to personally appeal to the right kinds of people in the right ways. For example, if you're the game master in Dungeons and Dragons, then you could dangle the right carrot in front of the person who cares a lot about loot. Or if you like solving problems and challenges, then throw more of those at the group if a lot of people like that. I often use role-playing games as a good example for teamwork because it really is a good simulation of having to need a variety of people to complete many different tasks. It's one of the biggest takeaways. And in real life, if you play these pen and paper RPGs with people, it's actually, I think, one of the highest forms of art and a good way to develop a lot as a person and build connections with others. So if you've been curious to try something like Dungeons & Dragons for a long time, we're having a video coming out soon about that as well about what to expect and how to find players. And we're also gonna release a video after that about how to use your personality psychology in ways that'll make you have fun in the game or be able to pick your first characters or to be able to personalize the game based on the player base and their psychologies, if you're the game master. When selecting teammates, really filter a lot for people who have a lot of intellectual curiosity. It's not necessarily meaning that they're philosophical, that they read a lot, but people who are willing to grow, learn, adapt, more experienced people are searching best practices. Because people who are know-it-alls aren't going to grow at all because they think they already know everything, so aren't going to learn, aren't going to get better. And it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. If you're somebody seeking admission to a team, Think about your personal reasons in this way. Do you care a lot about your work environment and your culture and the people you're with? Or do you care about protecting the environment? Or is there a certain job function that's really fun for you? Because if you have these things in mind, then you're gonna end up with something that you're gonna enjoy and you're gonna do a better job. And even if you don't have the exact functional activity in mind, because for some people that's actually the secondary characteristic, maybe you could do a more generalist job, but at least be in a place that you like and just find somewhere to fit in. When it comes to selling people on joining your team, it actually shouldn't be that hard. Just look for more of the natural alignments because the person who's the right fit for the job is gonna want the job. They're gonna be attracted to it like a magnet and the person who needs that certain teammates to join them is gonna kind of create that opportunity and the world's gonna sort of fulfill it itself. What your job is to do is to just understand each other. For other people to go understand your team and what your needs are, what your purpose is, and what kind of a personality is gonna fit into that and for you to also be able to find out about them and if their natural proclivities, their interests, their background, but less so background, are gonna be able to complement the team. And in that way, you don't have to sell people. They don't, you don't have to keep up some constant hype or inspiration. People are gonna stick around longer. And you're gonna have an overall better, more functional team. So that's your methodology about how to understand yourself, start accounting for your weaknesses, be able to find the right kinds of people or at least methodologies to figure out these people and to be able to align their personal innovations with inspiration and the group's bigger goals. Now we're gonna get into a lot of just random considerations about different kinds of personalities, tips and advice from my experience that I think are relevant to share. But again, feel free to share in the comments if you have other questions and I'll do my best to answer those. If you want strong long-term employees, this is often gonna be found in a lot of caretakers, administrators, accountants, then look for high introverted sensing and extroverted feeling. SI and FE high in their function stacks, the higher the better. Because these kinds of people are gonna stick around and they're gonna stick around not just out of a sense of enjoying routine and risk aversion, but they're also gonna be tied to the comfort and stability of having the right people in place, the right consistent lifestyle. When looking at intuitive types, often having the strong imaginations and connecting the dots, 
leads to missing reality. Especially if somebody is a lead intuitive type, then they're gonna often have elaborate theories that aren't actually applicable. Whereas if you have strong sensors, especially lead sensors, extroverted sensors, introverted sensors, they're gonna be a little bit too obsessed with the data and maybe not trust their imaginations enough or be bold to try something innovative that's needed. So oftentimes, and especially when you have people that are on the extremes, it's really good to put them together to be able to balance each other, to find out what is the data showing? Is this a creative idea? Does it actually fit the data? And is it gonna work in reality? Then you have introverted thinking. This is a very technical laser-like function. But a lot of the times in a team that has a lot of introverted thinkers, they're gonna have really bad documentation that they each other can't read because each of them's written it for their own form of logic that's very personal but can go very deep and actually accomplish a lot. But it's not as good for social spectrum. This is especially true for being able to manage each other, keep sync on the tasks that they're working on and being able to communicate outside of your own team. So in this way, if you have a lot of introverted function people, especially introverted thinkers, it's good to have some sort of extrovert feeling or extroverted thinking person to be able to balance this and cover those weaknesses. Something that I've noticed in technical teams is it's actually okay to have a disproportionate amount of thinker types beyond what a natural balance would suggest if it's a lot of engineering or computer-related work. But in a large organization, you're especially also going to still want feeler types to be able to remember people's birthday, add more life and zest to a workplace, resolve disputes, things like that to make a job or a team or a community, not just something in the short term or somewhere to go to get the work done, but something more sustainable, providing community and a lifestyle for places that we might be spending a lot of our time and caring about our relationships. When dealing with introverted feelers, being able to figure out their personal motivations for things, their personal values, is extra super important because that's really what's gonna drive them, especially if they're lead introverted feelers. So no, does this person wanna optimize for money? Is that what they value? Or are they wanting to fight environmental damage? Or are they just looking for somewhere fun where they can do a certain task? Because without aligning an FI person's tasks to the job, they're gonna flake off, disappear, or just be miserable, lower the energy, and just not perform well. On the other hand though, if you have an extroverted feeler, they're a lot easier about doing things on behalf of other people because their values are a lot more fluid where they could be fulfilled helping somebody else be fulfilled. And this is especially true as a consultant or in an agency where they can do that kind of mercenary work and be a lot more satisfied with it. And this also applies to extroverted thinkers as well who are a bit more about group logic, but they're gonna be a little bit less content on different missions that change over time. Extroverted sensors in general are going to gather in a lot of facts, a lot of data. If they're using the internet, they're often going to have a lot of tabs open. And then the next best thing to do is have introverted sensors then start organizing the data, coming up with a structure and outline. Extroverted intuitives are then going to come up with a huge amount of ideas connecting all those dots. And the introverted intuitives are best at taking those ideas and whittling them down like through a funnel to figure out after this whole process, which one is the one that kind of coherently makes sense and then also is able to reconcile itself with a lot of other considerations. In the Game Tree team, we've actually changed our brainstorming process to bring in a lot of different stakeholders as well. So we'll have uh, the designer, the programmers, uh, data scientists, operations people, marketing sales, all in on things together because we just get so many different kinds of considerations. That doesn't mean we have everybody there all the time, but at least being able to get those different kinds of viewpoints is really useful. I'll close with that on this sort of information because there really is an infinite amount of stuff here and so much of it is so contextual to your own situation. And that's why I really recommend getting to know this stuff better for yourself, diving into personality psychology, not just for this, but in general, it's just so useful to know in life. And also this is my first time announcing that we've made a Patreon. So if you found this video useful, or you've used our app or watched our other videos and like those, really appreciate your support. And we actually have a lot of rewards there, like if you want personal consulting or some feedback on understanding your own personality type, or to be able to understand other people's personality types, as well as other rewards, check that out. Thanks and see you next time.